that's what I have to say about peak finding. Back to the analysis workflow diagram. Now we're going to come over here to the green section about RNA-seq. Um, I will mostly sort of talk about differential expre expression and a little bit about transcriptome assembly and variant calling. So RNA-seq. Uh -oh. So when you align your RNA-seq files, your sort of first decision is, do I want to align it to the entire genome or just the transcriptome? Uh, if you do it just to the transcriptome, it's going to be faster because the transcriptome is a lot smaller uh, than the genome, uh, more so in more complicated animals like mammals. Um, it also provides you basically an implicit filter. If you really trust your transcriptome, if you have some stuff in your, in your, in your reads which are not part of that, you've basically implicitly filtered them out. Now, if you don't trust your transcriptome, if you think there are things that have not yet in transcriptome, you'll be losing that stuff. Uh, so in general, people do whole genome alignments. Uh, this has the benefit of, hey, there's some part of the genome. It's actually being transcribed, but no one knows it yet. And um, generally it's been shown, especially with um, splice variants, that there's a lot of stuff that we thought we knew, but actually looks a little bit different. So People do new experiments with whole genome alignment, but generally finding new things that are actually being transcribed that are not yet in the official annotations. Um, and one of the uh, main uses of RNA-seq is differential expression. And the basic idea behind it is um, the abundance of transcripts is a rough proxy for gene expression, and the more abundant the transcript is, in theory, uh, the more represented that transcript read should be in your sequencing file. Um, and you have some cell or tissue type. Um, you have some control state or normal state. Then you can perturb that due to disease or some other signal. And then you expect some of the genes to change their transcription state. And that should be reflected in uh, a second sequencing run of its, of its RNA, which should show that the abundance of transcripts should have affected the abundance of the reads associated with those genes that have changed in regulation. Um, there are a number of normalization issues um, with doing RNA-seq. Um, some of the most obvious ones, if you have a long transcript, it's going to get more reads because it was bigger. And when you chopped up your, DNA, uh, your, your RNA and made it into cDNAs, there's just going to be more of it. Um, then you're going to have certain genes, which are just like some sort of um, housekeeping genes. They're just expressed all the time, and they may be expressed at really high levels. And this can really skew uh, the results, because they may dominate your sequencing run. Um, and if you have really low-expressed genes, uh, they may be missed entirely if they're too swamped out by other uh, higher-expressed genes. And even when they do get sequenced, uh, you may not have enough of them to really provide enough for a sort of uh, statistically valid results. Um, what you'll often see, and this is one of the most simple forms of normalization, is FEKM, which is fragments per kilobase of exon per million fragments mapped. So you can see it's a very basic sort of normalization because first it normalizes over the length of the transcript. So the more kilobases within a transcript, and even though it's a kilobase, it's actually done to some precision. Um, it's not like you just round to the nearest kil kilobase. Uh, so first, it normalized the length of transcripts, and then it's normalized to how many million fragments have been mapped. So um, like I was talking about on Tuesday, um, on different runs of the sequencer, one run you might get 100 million reads, another run you might get 150 million reads. Uh, so if you want to compare data between two different runs, uh, you're basically, this last part is normalizing between uh, how many total fragments you have in that particular run. Um, you don't want to just, yeah, if, you're, if your second run was 150 million reads, and the first one was 100 million reads, suddenly everything will be mysteriously upregulated, right? But you don't want that because it's not true. Um, so the bow tie package is actually part of this larger package of things named after tuxedo items. Um, so another part of it is called top hat and uh, something called cufflinks. 
um, this basically, this group has basically provided an all-in-one analysis package. Um, it's also designed in a somewhat modular uh, fashion, so like bowtie outputs SAM files, so you could use part of, of this package and get your SAM files and then take your SAM file and run off and do some other sort of analysis with it. Or you could produce your SAM files from a different aligner like BWA. So like I said, BWA output requires a little bit of massaging in order to get back into the sort of top hat couplings uh, pipeline. Um, they have a major protocols paper that came out last year. Uh, it's kind of like a mini Bible for usage. It's pretty nice. It's basically uh, doesn't talk too much about the science of it, but gives lots and lots of examples. Um, and for those of you who are not on Tuesday, we will send out my whole set of PDFs for this file afterwards. Um, I'll just quickly go over uh, the modules that are in Tuxedo, or I'm not sure if there's an official name, but part of their user group is called the Tuxedo user group, so I'm just going to go with that to name everything. Uh, there's Top Hat. Uh, what Top Hat does is it uses bow tie for alignment. Uh, for the reads that it cannot align, it actually breaks them up into smaller chunks and then tries to align the individual chunks. And if it can align them in such a way that there's one and then some gap in another, it decides, oh, I think this is a read from a piece of RNA that actually spans two exons, and so this is a splice junction. Um, so top hat can be used to basically get more reads, especially the ones that were not easily, that, that crossed exon boundaries. Um, the couplings part of the module, um, and even though I just said that FDKM is kind of the most basic form of normalization, tends to form the sort of backbone behind um, this whole sort of tuxedo set of modules. Uh, couplings can perform, um, if you give it um, an annotation file, it can just do a, a very basic FDKM analysis of every gene that you put in the annotation file. Um, it's more, it's actually a much more powerful program. If you don't give it an annotation file, it will in fact do a guess of what the transcriptome is. By taking all the reads you have, it sort of aligns them on top of each other. When enough of them sort of form a thing, it says, okay, this is an exon. And then using some of the splice junction information, it will link different exons up to each other. And then it will just sort of give them each a unique identifier and it will create what it thinks your transcriptome is. Um, what you can then do is use another utility they have which is called Cuff Compare. You can take one of these GTF annotation files you can take the transcriptome that Cufflinks came up with and it will compare them. And it will tell you if Cufflinks came up with stuff that is not in your reference. Uh, in this case, you may have found new things that are being transcribed that's not in the official annotation. Uh, Cuff merge just merges some of them together. Uh, Cuff diff is their basic tool for the differential expression analysis. It basically takes the FPKM values from one Cufflinks analysis to another couplings analysis, and it performs some statistics, and it decides whether or not um, the change in expression levels is enough to constitute um, actual differential expression. Uh, then there's a thing called Cummerbund, uh, which is our, pro uh, our package, which basically just lets you uh, plot the results of cuff diff. Um, here, just to give you a quick example, this is the couplings output. Um, some of these um, are blank because this is a, a rather simple run. Uh, but whatever your annotation file is, in this case, sort of general GenBank identifier, um, its locations, it will give you an FPKM value. Uh, then it will give you this confidence interval. Um, this has to do with the fact that some of these normalizations are not always uh, deterministic. So it will give you a sort of lower confidence interval and a higher confidence interval as well as what it thinks its best guess is. Um, this is an example of a cuff diff um, output. Uh, you had sample one, that was one state of your um, it was a sample from sort of your sort of control state. And then sample two, uh, your treated state, actually they can be interchanged if you want. Um, the status column is basically telling you whether or not it thinks it had enough reads to actually perform a statistical test. If there's no test, it felt like it didn't have enough reads to perform a statistical test. 
Um, these two values are uh, a form of normalization of the FPTM values. It'll tell you what the fold change is. Um, this is a sort of internal uh, test stat about uh, what it thinks about the fold change, and then it will give you a P and Q value on whether or not on on its um, whether on whether or not on its guess of was this a significant fold change or not. Um, again, these are both sort of tab delimited files. Uh, one of the useful things you can do, for example, if you import this into Excel, which is something I did for this file, which was I sorted by this last column. It'll tell you everything that it thought was significant. And then everything that said it was not uh, will come below that. Though quite often you will, for example, take this cuff diff stuff, put it into another program like Cumberbund to actually visualize it all in a nice sort of graph. 